Hello and welcome to Journalist Hangout UK. This is a show where we discuss issues both African and worldwide which are affecting the continent. We look at how those issues are seen at home and in the African diaspora. I'm Tamsang Ngajo and I'm pleased to be joined by a distinguished panel of Hesh, journalist, barrister and author. Lanri Akinola, editor of African Business, and Priscilla Nripo, public affairs analyst. Welcome. Uh, Afua, let me start with you. Uh, we've got great news that uh, Africa is putting billions of dollars into the space program. Um, should people be looking at that and be jubilating or they should worry that that money should be directed elsewhere? I think it's a mixed picture. I think a lot of people misunderstand what space programs are. It doesn't necessarily mean launching a rocket into space or putting a man on the moon. Um, a lot of it is about trying to improve development on Earth, you know, harnessing more data for agriculture and climate change. So I think, you know, obviously that's welcome. Um, however, I think my scepticism is that we already have quite a lot of data about what's happening and it's not so far being utilised as effectively as it could to uh, improve agriculture and um, policies around climate change. So I think that it's a really exciting area. I'm really pleased we're discussing it, but I think it needs to be taken with a pinch of yeah, pretty, pretty. <laughs> I can mean, we, I. Can we, yeah, can you, we can we look at that? She she's actually saying there's a lot of data out there, but um, should, should I mean, I mean, I, I I do agree with her to an extent because indeed, you know, um, when we hear Africa going into space, everybody's thinking it's about rocket um, rocket launching, but it's not. Um, not purely solely about that. Um, I think what we need to appreciate is the fact that currently it's being said that Africa missed the first industrial re revolution, we missed the second, we can't afford to miss the third one. What is the third one all about? Technology. And, you know, we must be on that train. And if we're looking at the technological aspect of things, you know, yeah. within um, having a, a space program, then yes, yeah, welcome part, Africa. Yeah, part, part of the argument could be that we, we started uh, the space program. Landry, let, let me come to you. Because when I was growing up, I was being told that um, our forefathers actually tried to get to the moon. Um, it, it didn't work, but they tried. But now we are being told that uh, South Africa is going to be the leading launch pad for the next big thing in space. Um, how, how do you see that? Panel? Well, uh, I'm assuming you're referring to the Square Kilometer Array in South Africa, which yes. is the planned world's biggest radio telescope, which is actually an international, uh, it's an international project, uh, which is exciting. Look, in terms of <coughs> space exploration, uh, Priscilla and Afwa have, I think, really um, touched on the core issue, which is it's not just about, hey, getting a man on the moon or, or sending rockets into space. There are all sorts of real world applications from communications to surveying to conflict monitoring to weather monitoring and all of this, which is all hugely significant. But I don't think we should um, you know, forget that there's also the bigger picture, the more aspirational picture, the, the, you know, the sort of human endeavor picture of doing the impossible. And I think it's refreshing that Africa for once is not just waiting for the rest of the world to go and do it and then try and follow, but to say, well, why can't we be part of you know, the cutting edge of technology? Um, I think it's an underrated opportunity and it's, it's encouraging. I quite, I, quite, I quite like what you say. Um, the biggest telescope is going to be in South Africa. Well, that's, that's, that's my area, that's southern, <laughs> southern Africa. So Priscilla, it's, yeah. it's the biggest, let, let's not have even a debate. It is well, you the know biggest that South Africa telescope. can't do this no, without the, the help of Nigeria. Yeah, so we're not going to go into the our parts of the African the continent per se. It's so a radio telescope, <laughs> <laughs> by Important the way. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Um, but I will say this, one mm -hmm. of the things that I think Africa really needs to leverage on, you know, with the space program is their human capital. Yes. Um, that we, we are very fond of exporting our human capital and a lot of the space programs around the world are actually, believe it or not, abled by Africans um, who are engineers and, and who are experts within this, this area. When the US, for instance, uh, um, yeah, I say a few years ago, but you know, um, a few years ago, when they were dropping out of the sky each time they tried to go into space and they were falling apart, it was actually a Nigerian. I know I said that so loosely. It was it was actually a, a Nigerian who was who was said to have come on board um, and worked with with the with their space agency to yeah. prevent that, and he was able to do that. I, I actually met him once, um, Professor um, um, Augustine Asubi. He, you know, he's and he's retired back to Nigeria and wanting to 
contribute um, to, to the development of Africa, to, you know, to share that knowledge that he has and those skills. Yeah. So I think if Africa is able to harness on individuals like that, I mean, we will not be lagging and behind in any way. Yeah, of, of course, there's, there's, there's so much happening around. Um, Afua, let me, let, well, let I wanted me come to pick to up on what Priscilla was saying yeah. about human capital because part, I don't know if you've seen the film Hidden Figures about yes. the four yeah. African American women who played yeah. actually a, a pivotal role in yes. um, the US space program. I don't know how much of a contribution Africans have made to European and American space programs, but I imagine it's significant. You know, we've, we have all this talent um, in the diaspora that's been working away on other countries' space yeah, okay, programs. Let, me, let so me take you back and say the Apollo uh, project, as it were. The main person behind that was Egyptian. Exactly. Um, El Baz, Farouk El Baz, he was the person who, uh, whose, whose knowledge was actually used to, to make a determination where are you going to land, what are the conditions, and he trained the astronauts that were actually going and, there. So and there I think go. part of this is about identity, about um, a kind of Africans having confidence that they've already played a huge part in this innovation, and there's no reason why we can't do it on the African continent. But one thing I just wanted to mention, looking at the countries that do have space programs, you mentioned mentioned Egypt, it's one of them, Ghana, Nigeria, Kenya, South Africa. Mm. Um, it's really interesting that no Francophone nations, except Algeria, is the only yeah. Francophone nation that has a space program. And why is that? I, I, it makes me think more about the kind of bigger patterns of colonialism and relation, <laughs> because yeah, it, it's almost as if they are not standing on their own two feet yeah, and yeah. driving this innovation yeah, forward. Okay. They don't have control of their finances. That's the unfortunate thing with the Francophone company. Um, and this is where it really starts and to show. This is absolutely, because in order for them to be able to, you know, um, s uh, commence their own space program, they need to seek permission from France, and they need to seek access to their money that is banked in France. Okay, hold, hold on to that because I want to uh, get to Landra about something. She did mention countries like Algeria, mm -hmm. and we know that um, Islam has played a role for centuries in terms of uh, what happens in the uh, space project. And now we are seeing all this investment going in. You mean in, s in science? In science, right. in general. As well, yeah, look, we're talking astronomy. around one of the great things about space exploration, which is it brings people together rather than divides them. We've spoken about the different nationalities and ethnicities that have contributed to making things happen, right? And this is the point I made earlier around human endeavor. And this is something that uh, few things are able to do in, in this kind of fashion, right? Because it's a challenge that's bigger than all of us. Uh, and for me, I'm less sort of about, hey, Africa in space. It's just, it's nice to be part of that, you know? But I don't think, for me, it's not, for me, it's not about, oh, we must, Africans must take the lead, isn't that? No, as people, as humans, as a species, this is the sort of thing that, it, it's a rare occasion when we come together rather than, you know, uh, divide yeah. each other. And there's too much of that going on. So, yeah. you know, if, if, if it can contribute on some, I know this is I've not that tangible. I've never heard you sounding so, so, <laughs> so well, That's because before. we've never yeah. spoken about space yeah. exploration. Yeah. This is uh, the so power of space yeah. technology. This, this is exactly right. <laughs> but Afua, uh, um, I, I, I know that in Ghana, there, 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 are, there are telescopes are not as big as the South African one, but they are still doing <laughs> It's some. a radio My telescope. My telescope is bigger than your telescope. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they are, you know, they are, they are, they are pushing. And he's Zimbabwe as well, the, not even yeah, South Africa. They, this, is my, this is my area. Oh, <laughs> you know, remember even that Zambian teacher who, who tried to start up a space program, you know, they're important oh, things. The but Ghana... Yeah, the tree. <laughs> yes, but, well, but if you're going to borrow on South Africa, I'm going to borrow on Nigeria, because yeah. they're... they're but of and course, well, they want to put uh, astronauts <laughs> by 2030 in, uh, yeah. in space. I think, I think that's happening. feasible. I mean, look, Ghana has a space program. It's invested um, in the last government about 15 million into it, which, you know, it's a lot of money for a country like Ghana in the scheme of things. It's not enough on its own to kind of have a transformative space impact. But there's a center in Kofridua in the eastern region. There's lots of research going on. They are already collecting data about farming and climate, um, and it's already being used. So, you know, it's a good example of how a country that isn't one of the mega powers on the continent can, with sensible investment, harness some really useful results to improve productivity. Yeah. But what Ghana has been able to do is attract investment from the Japanese, and probably we have seen the Chinese uh, talking about Nigeria and uh, the prospects there. Uh, is this the agenda for other people or it is an African agenda? No, of course it's an agenda for other people, um, as well as an African agenda. It's not just solely an African agenda. Um, you know, just, just running up on, on what Afro is saying just there. No, not the telescope. <laughs> okay. You are not going to have that telescope without Nigeria's involvement. <laughs> yeah. We control things. Fair, fair, you know fair that, to right? say there's two okay. billion, two okay. billion okay. US so, dollars so coming anyway, from Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you. How much is coming from South Africa? 
Okay, well, we'll rest the human capital. So as, <laughs> <laughs> as I was saying, okay, a bit as distracted. I, <laughs> yeah. no. it's, it's, anyway, going back to, to the issue, um, the case in point, um, yes, it is great. If we're looking at the ag agricultural impact and yeah. data study and all of that, there is a question that we do need to ask. Do we really need to spend that much money? being in space in order to have that data because we can yes. we can't pay for that data because yes. it already exists and given you know the kind of money that that data um, you know getting all of that with all of the space program is taking can, can up, I just comment should on this? we not um, be yeah. focusing yeah. a little bit more yeah. no, on Lander more Lander infrastructural wants to, wants to development but, so but before before um, before, before you do this radio telescope okay okay, okay. Um, okay. Madam, before, before Lander yeah. before you do this is quite an important project there's a lot of money going in uh, South Africa Africa, of course, there are so many other countries. Mm -hmm. It's not only it's South an Africa. Effort, yeah, it's yeah. an international yeah. uh, project. But we also know that this is going to be the, the biggest um, data processing area. We can answer so many questions. That's positive, isn't it? Yes, it is positive. Um, I want to make a point on the value for money. Space exploration is actually quite cheap. Um, remember um, Curiosity? the mm -hmm. car-sized um, rover that was put on Mars? Right. Do you know how much that costs, the entire project? How much? Remind me. Two billion dollars. Okay. There's a guy in Malaysia who's just spent four point eight billion dollars on a private yacht. <laughs> you know, so it's not. Don't so, put it like that. No, so, you, so, so the thing is, like, if two billion dollars gets you a car on Mars, and four point uh -huh. eight billion dollars gets you a, a play, uh, basically a rich boy's toy, you know, it's a question of priorities as well. If you, you know, there is th there's this underrating of the value of space exploration, of scientific exploration and scientific furthering. If you look at society today, the biggest breakthroughs in improvement of human lives have come through scientific discovery. I, I space exploration is a core okay. aspect of that. So for me, it's like we, we're not spending nearly enough on space I exploration. I agree with you. I'm not okay. disagreeing yeah. with that. I, I am okay. saying Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on, guys. <laughs> hold on, guys. I'm, I'm quite interested in this uh, thing that Landry brought up, which is the value of money and where you want to put. No, but uh, we want to take a quick break. Um, <laughs> but we've got more uh, to discuss ahead. So please join us after a few moments because these people here, the people that I'm hanging around with want to talk about where the money around. should go. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to Journalists Hangout UK. I'm Tamsin Ngajo and I'm pleased to welcome back our panel of Wahesh, Lanre Akinola and Priska Mripo. Now, before we went to break, we were talking about uh, Africa's space program and whether or not it is worth using billions of US dollars on that project. Now, Afua, you wanted, uh, you, you, were, you. you sounded very passionate I had, I had, about I, had, I wanted to respond to what Priscilla was saying because she was questioning why we need our own space projects when we could just buy the data. And actually, I think that's part of it. I think we have been spending billions already buying data from private companies that are on the whole not African. Um, and it's another example of how instead of just um, using money from precious budgets to spend to foreign companies, we could actually be building our own, investing in our own infrastructure and owning it. And as well as the e immediate economic benefits of which there are, as I was saying, you know, for, for agriculture um, and uh, population studies, mm. Um, there are, there's also the, the psychological impact of knowing that you can actually start to own your own projects. You start then training a generation to work on these projects. And, you know, just to give you an example of how I think this is an investment. So in Ghana, I've done a lot of um, reporting on illegal gold mining, Galamse, which has been destroying unimaginably large swathes of the rainforest um, with predominantly Chinese miners coming in and taking out the gold and leaving long-term environmental consequences, you know, putting mercury in the water table as well as deforestation, depriving people of their, li people of their livelihoods, health implications. Now, 
this is what's good and um, to be taken with caution about space programs. These um, satellite images can really help government see good. and map the scale of this. Yeah, let, but let, mm -hmm. before we had satellite imagery, you could still see the scale of it by driving around the country and no one was doing anything. So yeah. I think the data can be really useful, but it's, it's, it's necessary, but not sufficient. Let me find out what, uh, remember you were saying that uh, Nigeria uh, has got all these experts who are working elsewhere, uh, who can be brought back home. Um, th these satellite images have been useful uh, to against poaching, against uh, terrorism, and even searching the mm -hmm. Chibo girls and mm -hmm. all that. That is data that the Nigerians were asking for from the Americans and others when they could have been doing that themselves. The Chibo girls could have been found a long time ago. Well, I think, you know, because Nigeria has, what, have they not launched something like four or five satellites into space? So did they really need to ask America for the data? if we're going to go along those lines. I don't think they did. Um, the main problem here, which has always plagued us, is our will and ability to you know, be accountable for what we are doing. Um, much as I agree that yes, it, it's a great investment for Africa, but are we going to own it at the end of the day? Or are we going to sign away a contract that just allows us to pay for things and other people own it and we will engage um, other nationals to build and develop? And we are still in effect just paying for data in that manner. Whereas if we are you know, going to put these stations in place ourselves and we, we, we put together a contract that ensures that Africa does indeed truly own it. That is where okay. our problem lies, okay, and Chris, we're not uh, utilizing our human me, capital. Let, let, let me uh, stop you there. I wish we guys could hang out together more often. <laughs> a lot longer. Um, yeah, but, but Landry, before, before, yes, before we move on to yes. something else that I want to talk about as well, um, we, we are looking at this African uh, participation in space, good news, developing a lot of engineers coming on board, inspiring new generations. Um, let me give you the final word on that subject, looking forward, good news, but um, what else needs to be done? Well, it, Priscilla is right in that it's gonna come down to just how you manage it. The opportunity is there. Usually in Africa, things fall down because they're poorly executed. It's not because the, the potential isn't there. Very briefly, what, one thing we haven't talked about at all is that this is also a business. The global satellite industry is a $260 billion a year industry. Uh, Africa's internet penetration rates are just 31%. A big part of that is going to rely on satellites. Africa's pay TV market is expected to hit $6 billion by 2021. 70% mm -hmm. of that is reliant on satellites. So these are also commercial opportunities that Absolutely. can be tapped into. And by the way, the deal that uh, Nigeria struck with China last uh, last week. Mm -hmm. It's a $550 million deal for two satellites. Guess who's paying for them? China, not Nigeria. No, no, no. Okay. We All always right. pay okay. back. Okay. <laughs> China ain't okay. going to do we that will for pay free. Back. We, will pay, we will pay back. <laughs> but uh, there, there's something very, very, very important that I want us guys to, to discuss as we hang out um, before, before the Friday is over, before the weekend is over. Um, and, and I want to direct that to, to Afua because you are a prolific writer. And um, if Mo Ibrahim was to come to you and say, we are offering you five million uh, US dollars, stop writing, um, would that be something that you would accept if it's something that you love doing for life? I don't think that's a fair question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's a fair question. I would, yes. By the way, I would love Mo Ibrahim to give me five million dollars. So if he's watching, I wouldn't say no, but I also wouldn't stop writing. I think I'm not a political leader, and part of the responsibility of being a political leader is that at the end of your term, you aim to leave your country in a better place and hand over to the next person who is democratically elected. That's the ideal. So I think you're talking about the Mo Ibrahim Prize, which hasn't yes. been awarded since 2014, because mm. they require leaders to meet certain criteria to win the prize. So they haven't been able to find anyone since 2014 <laughs> who meets these criteria of responsible leadership, transparency, and handing over peacefully. Okay, um, so, so what happens sometimes when that kind of money is not available? We have seen some uh, certain governments um, offering packages to allow other leaders to, to leave. Uh, the case in point um, is my own country, uh, where, uh, because so this is the Africa. latest. Is it South Africa or yeah. Zimbabwe? Oh, Zimbabwe. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in this particular Zimbabwe. instance, little, yeah, yeah. this is the latest president to leave power. Uh, and there's a, there's a very handsome uh, you know, package in retirement that uh, my former president, Robert Mugabe, is, is, is getting um, with people talking about millions, Landry. So how, how, how do you see that? 
Well, so the number I've heard is that he's got a $10 million package to, to, to go away and you know have a nice retirement. He's got dozens of people who are being assigned to take care of him and a certain allowance of first class travel every year, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's, the, ir the, the sad thing is that by African heads of state standards, it's, it's a pretty modest package. Uh, the question is, should he be getting that kind of money given the circumstances that many Zimbabweans fa find themselves in? It's a difficult one because um, the transition that Zimbabwe is going through is very delicate right now. It is uh, far from done. And what I read behind this is that the guys who are now taking over, they just want to make absolutely sure that there is no going back on what has happened. They want to make sure that Robert Mugabe just goes and lives out the rest of his life in peace. And it sounds to me like they want to protect his legacy. For me, the big question is how do ordinary Zimbabweans feel about this? And uh, I don't know what the answer to that is, but I suspect a lot of ordinary Zimbabweans probably aren't too happy about this. Chris, um, you've been looking at how most Zimbabweans react. <laughs> you've got lots of them around you. Um, what's your take on this? Well, you know, I think it's subject to whose narrative you read, really. Um, you know, he, some would say that he served his country for well over 30 years. And so there is a degree, there is something that comes with that, um, whether he was ousted or he retired, whatever you want to call it. Um, every president around the world retires and they are well paid. Um, president, o former President Obama will always have a security detail that's paid for by the state. He's going to have a handsome pension. All previous U.S. presidents have that. We also have it here in the United Kingdom. Um, so, okay, um, Mugabe has 25 personnel that's been reported, subject to, again, where you read it. What is the big deal? By the time we add up how much the security detail we have to pay for those security details that looks after all those former presidents, and we have to add up all the monies that they will be receiving in, in um, you know, pensions and others that we're not told about, you know, mm. that, that all yeah. the secret private handshakes that go on, um, it will probably add up to the magnified figure that we're screaming about for Robert yeah. Mugabe. Yeah. He, he, he has to go with a figure. That's yeah. just what his country offered but him. I don't, I yeah. don't think but anyone's questioning whether Robert Mugabe, a long-time head of state, should have a pension and be taken care of. And there are security reasons as well as everything else why mm. it's not practical to have a 93-year-old man who's been head of state, you know, just kind of put up in some shack somewhere. I mean, obviously... How much longer is he going to be um, around for anyway? But, but I, I, I'm interested in the motive behind this package because it is a generous package. I mean... Lamry's right, yeah. you know, we're in, in the context of the extreme and unique extravagance of African leaders, it, it could be worse. But, you know, it's 24 full-time members of staff, um, five brand new, three brand new cars replaced every five years, first class travel, et cetera, et cetera. Um, for me, I'm wondering if, I know that we hear that there's a desire to not rock the boat, to make sure he stays out of power. But at the same mm. time, some of the promises around immunity seem like they're already in question. So Grace Mugabe now is being investigated for corruption, I've, I've read, because of her degree, uh, her PhD, which she earned in less than a month no, or no, so. Okay. Uh, uh, so, yeah, so, so there are other things happening that are, yeah. that are threatening this new order. So I wonder, this deal that Mugabe's okay. been offered, the, the, okay. that can't okay. be the only explanation. Okay, yeah, so, so Landry, um, there are issues. Zimbabwe has a constitution that the country has to follow. The president uh, is entitled, a pension constitutionally, and everything else, and his wife, if he was not to be around, will have 60% or so. These are constitutional provisions. But uh, the, the main worry, and what most people are saying is, there is money, available in a country like Zimbabwe, billions and billions, but in the hands of a tiny minority and not That's the rest it. of the people. So, you know, you make the point around constitutional, uh, you know, uh, conditions. I suspect there are also all sorts of constitutionally guaranteed rights for the country's citizens, which are probably not as rigorously enforced as some of the constitutional uh, clauses that apply to the country's rulers. Um, look, this is the eternal question. Do African leaders care about their people? And it is always difficult to argue that they do in a situation where you have people who can't feed themselves, 
who can't send their kids to school, and you have heads of state who are being chauffeured around in you know $150,000 cars. So you know, like somewhere, something is not quite right about that, right? Uh, you don't need $10 million to live a comfortable life. Okay, let me let me stop you there, uh, Landre. I want us to continue with this discussion, and I, I know that uh, a lot of people at home and uh, everywhere else within the continent will be discussing these issues. At least for us, we have uh, discovered that the biggest uh, telescope in the world is in <laughs> South Africa. Radio telescope. Um, and with the help of And radio. that is going to be helping yeah. us. But don't forget to follow us on Real JHUK on Facebook, on Twitter, and Instagram. I'm Tamsang Najo from the entire team here. Uh, from those that are behind the scenes, goodbye and thank you for watching Journalists Hangout UK.